Welcome to Lesson 5C, Mutual Interaction of Vortices. In this lesson, we'll discuss the mutual interaction of vortices and how to calculate their trajectories. I'll also discuss some examples. First, a quick review of Helmholtz vortex theorems. Vortex lines move with the fluid. The strength or circulation of a vortex tube is constant along its length. A vortex tube cannot just end in a fluid, although it can end at a wall. And the strength of a vortex tube, again its circulation, is constant in time. Let's use this first vortex theorem to discuss the mutual interaction of vortices. We'll consider here only 2D flow, typically in the xy plane, where all vortices are aligned with their axes normal to the 2D plane. For example, in the xy plane, we can have a line vortex of circulation gamma with vorticity vector pointing out of the page. If this line vortex is in a flow field where these are streamlines, Helmholtz's vortex theorem number one tells us that this vortex will move with the fluid, in this case at some velocity u. But a vortex itself is a velocity field. We'll sketch what the flow looks like. Consider a vortex at the origin of our xy plane. This vortex has circulation gamma. As we've mentioned previously, the streamlines are circles around the origin, and u theta is the tangential component of velocity. The equation for a line vortex of strength gamma is u theta is gamma over 2 pi r. At some point in the flow, r is the radius or the distance from the origin to that point, or in general, from the center of the vortex to the point in question. So u theta at that point will be given by this equation. We'll write r here, but even when the vortex is not at the origin, r is the distance from the center of the vortex to the point in question. r is relative to the vortex's origin. This is important as we look at vortices that are moving. With this in mind, let's look at the mutual influence of two or more vortices in the flow. Qualitatively, if vortex one is there, and vortex 2 is there, Helmholtz tells us that this vortex will move at a speed that's equal to gamma 1 over 2 pi r1, where we'll call this r1. Meanwhile, vortex 1 will move at speed v1, which is gamma 2 over 2 pi r1. We call this mutual interaction of vortices. Let's do a quick example with three vortices, vortex A with circulation gamma A, vortex B with circulation gamma B, and vortex C with circulation gamma C. Suppose we're interested in where vortex B will move. Vectorially, the influence of vortex A will be this velocity, which I'll call u A on B. Notice that it's acting perpendicular to the radial arm between A and B. Similarly, vortex C will cause B to move at velocity u c on B, which will be perpendicular to this radial arm. To get the resultant velocity vector, we complete the parallelogram, and the resultant will be the velocity of B. Some trig would be involved, but if you know the locations of these three vortices, you can calculate this r and this r, and therefore these two velocities, both magnitude and direction, and then take the resultant ub is the resultant velocity vector induced by the other vortices. Note that vortex b has no influence on itself. It just causes the flow to go around it. Similarly, b would make c move in this direction. Vortex b would make a move in this direction. And vortex a would make vortex c move in this direction, etc. If you figure out the resultant velocity of vortex A and vortex C, and you let that march in time, you can predict where these vortices will go. Here's a simple example, a self-propelled vortex pair. We have two vortices of equal but opposite strength. Again, strength means circulation. Let's suppose these two vortices, A and B, have strengths gamma and negative gamma. Notice that the circulation is positive for a counterclockwise vortex, and the circulation is negative gamma for a clockwise vortex. Let A be the distance between the two vortices. Well, this one's pretty easy to figure out. UA will be to the right because the streamlines around vortex B are clockwise, and the magnitude is gamma over 2 pi A. This is the induced velocity on vortex A due to vortex B. Similarly, vector UB has the same magnitude, gamma over 2 pi a. 
both of these are moving to the right at some later time delta t i copied and pasted because these two vortices will just move to the right they'll stay the same distance apart since there's no component of velocity towards each other or away from each other theoretically they move at this constant speed gamma over 2 pi a together as a self-propelled vortex pair they would keep moving to the right forever in an inviscid flow in real life of course these vortices will start viscously decaying but until their viscous cores hit each other, we'll still see them self-propelled. As their vortex cores grow, they'll eventually cancel each other out. There's an axisymmetric analogy of this. Instead of a vortex pair, we would have a vortex ring. You can think of this as a slice through a vortex ring, but a vortex ring, and I'll try to draw this three-dimensionally, is a ring of constant gamma that loops around and attaches to itself in a circle or oval or any other shape as long as it's closed. At any point along here, the circulation is gamma. Take, for example, a perfect circle vortex ring. At any point along this ring, you would integrate the influence of all the other portions of the ring. The net result would be a speed to the right. So the entire vortex ring is self-propelled. Again, in the absence of net viscous effects, this vortex ring will move to the right at some constant speed v. I'll show two video clips of vortex rings. The first one is from YouTube, and I give the link. It's a huge vortex cannon. Dude, that's one humongous vortex cannon, man. Yeah, Joe, it sure is. If you think that one's big, wait till you see the next one. If you use light instead of smoke, you can make a type of photon torpedo. Uh, thanks, Captain Kirkhoff. That's a little bit beyond my area of expertise. The second clip is from weather.com. Again, I give the link. It shows vortex rings over Mount Etna. Cool, dude. Note that these are not smoke rings, rather they're condensate due to the low pressure in the center of the vortex, and water condenses into little droplets like clouds. We see the same thing in the contrails of a jet aircraft. Our next example is an orbiting vortex pair. Consider two vortices of equal strength, equal in both sign and magnitude. Again in our xy plane, we'll let vortex 1 be here with circulation gamma at distance r. From the y-axis. Vortex 2 is identical with circulation gamma, also at distance r. The net distance between the two is thus 2r, x1 equal r, x2 equal negative r, and y is 0 for both cases. These are the initial locations of our two vortices. Again, we can easily figure out what happens to these. The induced velocity of vortex 2 on vortex 1 will be straight up with magnitude gamma over 2 pi r, or gamma over 4 pi capital R. Meanwhile, vortex 2 will be induced downward with the same magnitude of velocity, but opposite direction. At some very short time later, as these vortices move, they're no longer on the x-axis, and the induced velocities will be tilted a little bit like that. If you think about it, these vortices will induce themselves into a circular flow. In other words, they'll orbit at speed v, which is gamma over 4 pi r, and they orbit around the origin or the center between the two vortices. So this is an orbiting vortex pair. Finally, let's do the math for two arbitrary vortices. We'll set ourselves up for a numerical solution. Consider vortex 1 of strength gamma 1 at initial location x1, y1, and vortex 2 at some other location with a different gamma, gamma 2, and initial location x2, y2. Let r be the distance between the two, and we know that vortex 2 will induce a velocity on vortex 1 of magnitude gamma 2 over 2 pi r. Similarly, gamma 1 will induce a velocity of gamma 1 over 2 pi r, where the directions are perpendicular to r. We can do a little bit of trig here, call this distance delta y, and this distance delta x, and this angle theta. This angle will also be theta, and we can split this velocity into components u1 and v1. We also note that r squared is x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. Again, a little bit of trig. u1 
is gamma 2 over 2 pi r, which is this long segment, times sine theta. But sine theta is delta y over r from this big triangle. So u1 is gamma 2 over 2 pi delta y over r squared. Similarly, this component v1 can be written as negative gamma 2 over 2 pi r cosine theta, where notice the negative sign because v is always defined as positive up, but it's negative here. And cosine theta, again from the big triangle, is delta x over r. So v1 is negative gamma 2 over 2 pi delta x over r squared. In terms of our original variables, the influence of vortex 2 on vortex 1 is u1 equal gamma 2 over 2 pi y2 minus y1, which is our delta y, over r squared. And remember that r squared is given by our original coordinates x1, y1, and x2, y2. Similarly, v1 is negative gamma 2 over 2 pi x2 minus x1 over r squared. Thus, we can predict the induced velocity on vortex 1. Similarly, the influence of vortex 1 on vortex 2, if you draw a similar triangle up here and do the trig, you get u2 equal gamma 1 over 2 pi, y1 minus y2, notice the change of sign here, over r squared, and v2 is negative gamma 1 over 2 pi, x1 minus x2, again noticing the sign change, divided by r squared. I note that x1, y1, and x2, y2 are the positions of vortex 1 and vortex 2, respectively. This is not tensor notation. Now let's talk about a time-marching numerical solution for the interaction of two vortices. The way we'll set this up is to write four first-order nonlinear ordinary differential equations, or ODEs, for our four variables, x1, y1, x2, and y2, which are all functions of time. In other words, we want to track where these two vortices are going. How does x1 and y1 vary with time? And how does x2 and y2 vary with time? I'll write u1, by definition, is dx1 dt. And from our equations above, this is gamma 2 over 2 pi, y2 minus y1, divided by r squared. But remember that we wrote r squared as x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. This equation is nonlinear because of these squared terms. Similarly, v1 is dy1 dt, which is negative gamma 2 over 2 pi, x2 minus x1 over r squared. u2 is defined as dx2 dt, and again from our equations above, it's gamma 1 over 2 pi times y1 minus y2 over r squared. And finally, v2 is dy2 dt, which is negative gamma 1 over 2 pi, x1 minus x2, over r squared. Thus we have four first order nonlinear ODEs for x1, y1, x2, and y2 in terms of each other and the constant gammas. Plus, we have the initial conditions for all four variables, namely x1, y1, x2, and y2 at our starting time where we can put these two vortices anywhere we want, and we can assign any two gammas, positive or negative. To solve this set of equations, we march in time with small time steps numerically to predict where these two vortices will go. This can get tedious, so we do this on a computer. And in the next lesson, I'll show you how to march in time with these equations. Finally, I note that this set of equations is for two vortices, but we can easily extend this to more than two vortices by keeping track of all the induced velocities. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.